All right, class. First off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. So today's lesson is going to be about, as you see from the title, unlikely heroes. Now, these are people who basically I say like there's well, there's one group and then there's one individual and uh, both of them, the group and the individual person. If before the war started, you were to say these guys would be heroes. Um, yeah, a lot of people would be like, yeah, probably not. No. But you'll see what they did to accomplish that title because these guys really are heroes of World War II. Okay, so we're going to analyze who the Tuskegee Airmen were and how they became heroes. And then we're going to look at the individual named Audie Murphy. Now, a lot of you guys don't know who he is. Maybe even your parents have no idea who he is. But your grandparents, and if you're fortunate to have your great-grandparents around, definitely your great-grandparents would know who Audie Murphy is. At least, like, what he did for a job. You know, they would at least know that. Okay. So let's go ahead and get to the warm-up. So there it is right there for you. Okay. Now, this image comes from uh, a quarter. Okay. It was issued on January 5th, 2021. Chances are you have this quarter maybe in your house or in your little, if you have a little change uh, coin, you know, cup or something. It's probably in there. You probably you don't even realize it. But as you can see, those are Tuskegee Airmen. And it says on there they fought two wars. So my question to you is this. What two wars are they talking about? So one of them is pretty easy right off the bat. You should get it. Um, only one class had really trouble with that. They, I, I don't know if they were or, overthinking, but you really shouldn't think too much about one of the wars. The other war, you just got to put yourself in their situation, being a black man in America in the 1940s. So use your prior knowledge of stuff you learned in the past about what African Americans were going through in the 19, you know, 40s and 30s and 20s and going backwards. Okay, so there you go. Okay, so really think about it. Okay, uh, and uh, give your response. Okay, so pause the video, think about it. Okay, because we're moving on in three, two, one. Now, the way you pronounce that word that you know it's Tuskegee. Okay, it's not Tusky. Okay, that's what like some students said today and in previous years. It's Tuskegee. Okay. Now, Charles Lindbergh flies across the Atlantic Ocean solo, right? People are calling him a hero. Well, then a couple years later, basically, um, Amelia Earhart basically says, hold my beer. And she's the first lady to fly across the Atlantic solo herself. Now, these guys became instant heroes, instant celebrities. So this made a lot of people want to be pilots, especially little kids. You know, uh, and I give you the example, like if you watch the movie Up, when the, the boy meets his uh, future wife when she's a little girl, she's wearing these aviator goggles type of thing. That's what kids did. They wanted to imagine that they were in planes and flying in the air and all that, you know. So here's the thing. African-Americans were no different. They wanted to fly. They wanted to feel what it was like to be in the air and gliding and things like that. The problem is, especially in the South, they were not allowed to fly. You know, especially in the South, they weren't even allowed to sign up for classes. You know, so that's the, the harsh reality that they lived in. Now, in 1938, this is before World War II even starts, okay? President Roosevelt encourages civilians to try for the pilot, to try to be a pilot, you know, uh, go for the training program, try your best, you know. Uh, he really encouraged it. Now, around this same time, the U.S. military, okay, the top, you know, generals and some of that, they felt that, um, especially in the South, that black soldiers were inferior to white soldiers. That when push came to shove and bullets start flying, that black soldiers would run away. That they won't step up to the fight. That they'll drop their guns and run. And they're like, we can't chance it. Because, you know, they'll run. 
you know, these guys are not like white soldiers who will stay and fight. These guys, you know, you can't teach bravery. You know, they don't have that. You know, so that was their concession at that time. Now, in the north, in places like Chicago and Pittsburgh and places like that up north, um, they did allow African-Americans to take pilot classes. You know, now here's the thing. Like I told the classes um, both today and yesterday. To become a pilot, you don't just oh, I passed this test and I can fly now. No, you have to have hours logged in that you flew with an instructor who was a pilot who then could be like, okay, yeah, they know the basics. They know this stuff. They can fly on their own. I was there. I let them give the controls and so that. They did so many hours. So that's how you get your pilot's license. You just can't take a test like your driver's license and then that's it. You know, fly one time and that's it. No, you had to log in hours, okay? Now, in September 1940, Roosevelt, you know, remember I told you guys, he had, um, you know, several African-Americans in his cabinet. And they were basically telling him, you know, you need to start training black pilots. You know, because we might be getting into this war and um, we could use some black pilots. Now, Roosevelt's like, yeah, you know what? That's a great idea. Now, the U.S. War Department kind of didn't feel that same way but again he is the commander in chief they have to do what he says so what they then did was said okay yeah fine black pilots if you want to be a uh, pilot come on over guys we're going to train you in tuskegee alabama alabama is at that time one uh, it's not the uh, most racist states there is besides like mississippi that's like a close rival but other than that, yeah, Alabama is like one of the more racist. Now I asked students in class, why would they put this, these black soldiers or these black oh, pilots guys, why would they have them train in one of the most racist states there is? And one student, actually two students, um, gave great answers. And they were saying to the effect of they want them to be in a hostile environment and possibly then quit. You know, and yeah, I really agree with that. Again, like I told them, there is nothing and paperwork that says we want the African-American pilot people to quit. So we're going to put them in a very racist state. You know, um, they didn't have that written down anywhere, but it's kind of like, yeah, obviously, why would you put black people going to a very racist state? Why don't you send them up north? There's a plenty of other places where they can fly. Why down there? That's why. Now, here's the interesting thing. All the trainees were either college graduates or they were undergraduates, meaning that either they were, they had their bachelor's, master's degree, or they were about to get it. They were at least had their like associate's degree working on their bachelor's, working you know, towards possibly getting their master's in the future. So these guys were educated, okay? They weren't just some, like, 18-year-old bumbling kids, like, oh, I want to be a pilot. No, these guys were highly educated, and, um, yeah. Now, in the whole time of Tuskegee was around, there were about 1,000 guys who wanted to be pilots who signed up for it. And nearly 14,000 other guys signed up to be bombardiers, instructors, tower operators, navigators, aircraft, and engine mechanics. Okay? So not everybody who was going through Tuskegee was trying to be a pilot. They did other jobs, maintain, maintenance and some of that, uh, being in the, bomb, in the bomber planes and, like, navigating, saying, okay, we're, like, two minutes away from our target, get ready to drop the bombs and stuff like that, you know. So, that's the thing. Um, this is one of my favorite stories of this whole thing with the Tuskegee. Um, one day, the, uh, the, the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, shows up, and everyone's on alert, you know, because this is the First Lady. So, the top, you know, colonels and, you know, um, lieutenant generals and stuff like that, these guys are all right there, 
you know, hello, ma'am, how are you doing? This and that. Uh, welcome to Tuskegee. Let's let us show you around this and that. And she's like, no, I don't want you showing me around. She goes, I want that guy, the one you see in the picture there. That is Charles Chief Anderson. And she basically goes to him and says, I would like for you to give me a tour of this place. And he's like, yes, ma'am, absolutely. And she's like, well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want a walking tour. I want to go in the air. Now, mind you, he's not a full blown pilot yet. He's not, he's not given his wings. He's not certified, he's truly certified yet. Um, so she, he's like, yes, ma'am, whatever you say. So she gets on the plane and they take off. The thing is like a student said in class, they go, well, why did the other people, the top general people and stuff like stop her? I was like, well, she's the first lady. What are they going to tell her? No. You know? <laughs> you know? So she, they're flying in the air and some of that. And she's telling him, do you have any tricks on the plane? He's like, yes, ma'am. He does like a barrel roll and stuff like that, you know? And the the top people at the on the ground are looking like, oh, my God, what is he doing? Oh my God, they're going to crash. They're going to do something. The, the first lady's going to fall out of the plane or whatever, you know? So these guys are scared. And then when the plane lands, you know, uh, as you can see from that picture right there, look at, she loved it. She had an ear to ear smile. She enjoyed it so much. She had a blast, you know? And the thing is, they took plenty of pictures. There, there were publicist people taking plenty of pictures. They recorded it on film, and this was distributed nationwide. So people saw the pictures of uh, Charles Anderson and the First Lady flying in the air, you know, this and that. And it showed, hey, these guys are good pilots. They really are, you know. Uh, so on March 7th, 1942, the first graduating class of Tuskegee graduates. Originally, there was 13 guys who signed up to be pilots, but only five actually graduated. The rest uh, quit. I believe one person died. I can't remember um, from an accident. So, yeah. But the, the program was tough. A lot of asking questions, taking tests, things like that. Have them do difficult um, maneuvers and so that. But these guys did it. Those five. Okay. Now, in April 1943, the Tuskegee, um, who were, the Tuskegee men who were trained made up the 99th Pursuit Squadron, okay? And they were deployed to go fight in North Africa and Sicily. Here's the problem. They were given old P-40 planes, and these planes were already obsolete compared to what the Germans had and what the United States had. You know, these planes were... Not that great. They didn't maneuver well. They were slower than the German planes. And so the Germans, when they got in the fight, they were able to just, I mean, they could easily turn. And even if the the Tuskegee guy turned the same rate, the German was going to come around him and get him. You know, because again, that plane didn't maneuver well. It wasn't going fast compared to the German plane. All right. And a lot of them got shot down or killed. And so now the um, top brass people were like, well, look, see, see, what did we tell you? These guys can't fight. Look at, they're getting killed out there in the plane. And they're, they're, they can't fly. You know, it's one thing to actually fly, like, like practice. It's nothing in battle. And these guys can't handle it. Look at, they're getting shot up. So one guy named Commander Benjamin O. Davis. He is only one of two officers, black officers in the entire army. And he basically goes before a congressional hearing and he tells them, how can you expect these pilots to win when they're giving these old planes that the, these top people know aren't good? And when they say, oh, no, they're good planes, they're good planes, you know, they're really good planes. He says, okay, well, then give it to the white people. Give it to the white pilots. Let's see how good they do. And when asked, they're like, well, no, we, we you know, we, we can't give them to the, the white pilots. You know, we, uh, we can't do that. Why not? If they're good for the black soldiers, the black pilots, 
Why can't they be good for the white pilots? And they got them. And that's where the Benjamin O. Davis says, our guys can't fight. If you give them the tools they need, we're not asking for more. We're definitely not asking for less. We're asking to be equal with the white pilots. Give us the same planes that they have and watch what we can do. So the congressional hearing basically says, yeah, okay, do it. So the Tuskegee men are given the same planes as the white pilots. And in two days, they shoot down 12 German planes. That's not bad at all. So in February 1944, the top brass people decide, you know what, we're going to put all of the Tuskegee men together instead of having a bunch of different squadrons. So they took the 99th, the 100th, the 301st, the 302nd, and they combined them to become the 332nd uh, fighters group. Okay. Now, once they're officially made into this group, they are given the new P-51 Mustang plane, which is you see in that picture right there. And the plane is just as you see, it is clean. It is fast. There's not much drag to that plane. Now, if you don't know what I mean by drag, um, so it's like smooth. Usually most of these planes and some of that, there's like ridges, you know, from the bolts and some of that. So when air hits it, it drags the planes. It holds it back a little bit. But when it's nice and smooth, the air just goes right over and this thing can right through the air, you know. And that's exactly what happens. These guys, these uh, Tuskegee Airmen are in these planes and they're zipping through there. Man, they're amazing. Now, what they do to kind of distinguish themselves compared to other white um, escort planes, they paint the tail end of their planes red. And this is why they're known as red tails. So when a bomber's like, hey, where's our escort? Where's our planes at? Who are our guys? They could look out their window and see on the red end, like, oh, that, okay, those, those are the Tuskegee. Guys. Those are our guys. Okay. Now, one of the myths that I grew up with that when I heard about the Tuskegee Airmen was that the planes that they escorted, these bombers, they never lost one. They never lost a bomber at all. In reality, in truth, they did. Okay. They weren't perfect. They did lose, um, at, from what I could find, at least 25. And some numbers were a little bit higher, some were a little bit lower. Or sorry, not lower than 25, but at least 25. Um, but the thing is, it's not that bad. Compared to the average white um, escort planes, they usually lost about anywhere, you know, on average, 46 bombers. The Tuskegee, let's say they lost 30. Let's say, you know, let's just say 30. That's still smaller than... Uh, 46 so they didn't do too bad their last mission was on april 26 1945 and uh, they flew 15,000 escort missions all right and when they counted those missions it was like here's a bomber 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 and those planes that were following them those were five uh escort missions they didn't say like oh all five of these this is one mission no each one was its own mission. Okay. And so, yeah, 15,000 uh, escorts. And they only lost, like, again, like 30 bombers. That's not bad. They damaged or destroyed 36 planes in the air, 237 planes on the ground, nearly a thousand railway cars, uh, transport vehicles, jeeps, trucks, um, German destroyers, tanks. You know, they really um, did a good job. Now, of the like thousand guys who signed up and some of that, 66 Tuskegee Airmen were killed in action, KIA. And another 32 were captured as prisoners of the war, which we know as POWs. Now, it's because of these guys that on July 26, 1948, President Truman issues executive order. 9981, which then desegregates the armed forces. So now it's no longer in, like in any branch of the military. Here's white, here's black. No, the way it is now is like, hey, 
you guys are going to fight together. You're going to train together. So no more white over here, black over here. No, you're all together. Okay. So that was one group of unlikely heroes. Now we're going to talk about one guy who's considered basically an unlikely hero. His name was Audie Leon Murphy, born June, June 20th, 1924. This guy I basically call like the Captain America, you know, the real Captain America. So if you've ever watched the first movie of it, you'll know that Captain America was before the serum. He was a tiny guy, thin, things like that. Same thing with Audie Murphy. When he tried to enlist with the Marines, they had a height and weight requirement. So I think, believe if I remember right, you had to be like five, at least, at least five, seven, five, eight, something like that. And you had to weigh at least like 150 pounds. So you have to have some type of muscle in you. Audie Murphy was 5'5", five, five, weighing about 110 pounds. He was not allowed to be a Marine. But when he turned 18, he decided, I'm going to sign up for the Army. And the Army said, come on in. We'll take you. <laughs> and on one battle in particular, he was the commander of Company B. Now, what ends up happening is their tank is destroyed. The Nazis are shooting at them, right? And they're marching towards them. Uh, Audi is hurt. He has a hurt leg. He's telling his men, get behind, get behind. They're, we have reinforcements coming. Go to them. You know, things like that. So then what happens is he uh, jumps on that tank or that tank that's uh, on fire and stuff. And he just starts shooting at them. Right? He takes this uh, 50 cal machine gun and just starts firing at them. Firing at the tank. Okay? Now the tank is not going to get like turned into Swiss cheese because, again, it's a German tank. They're, they're pretty strong. But it is causing some damage. So the tank knows that hey, we can't take any more damage, but we also have to come forward a little bit more so that our men can outflank this dude. So the tank's coming up and he sees the Nazis coming from his left and his right side. So he turns the gun, da, 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 killing the Nazis, again, turning his attention to the tank, da, 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 right? All this time he's doing this, he's making sure his men are like behind and that they uh, get a good lead, you know? Now, the closest they got to him was about 10 yards. And like I said, he's hurt. His leg is hurt. Um, the tank's on fire, and he's constant, he's still fighting. Here's the thing. He leaves the tank, not because, oh, the Nazis are right there. It's because he ran out of bullets for the 50 cal machine gun. And he hops off, and he's chasing his men, right? He finds them, and he tells his men, all right, look at, look at, okay, the Germans are coming this way. You guys need, you group need to go this way. You guys need to go that way. You guys are going to come around to the side of them and just, like, catch them in a crossfire, okay? Oh, but then they're looking at it like, oh, sir, you're hurt, you're injured, you, you need to, uh, we need to tend your wounds. He's like, oh, forget that. Listen to me. Do what I'm telling you. You guys go out this way. You know, several yards, you know, face this way. You guys, same thing. Go several yards, several yards, turn this way, and we'll catch the Nazis right in the middle. So that's what they do. And then the Nazis, sure enough, come in straight towards where he was, you know, running towards. And they just bop, 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 start shooting at the Nazis coming from left and right. The Nazis are like, oh, my God, what? You know, they're like, we're, we're being pinned down. So they start retreating. Okay. Now. Here's the thing. Audie Murphy spent over a year on the front lines. Okay. The front line is where those are the first people to go into danger. You know, when they're entering a town or a battle or whatever, they're the first to go through. And he spent more than a year there. Leading his men, leading the people into dangerous territory. Okay. Pretty impressive. News and stories of him are coming back to the United States about what he's doing and some of that. He receives 33 military awards, citations, and decorations, which includes the Medal of Valor. Basically, every Medal of Valor 
that a soldier can get. And on top of that, he's getting three French medals and one Belgian medal. Now, he becomes, at that time, the most decorated soldier in American history. Mainly because of his bravery and his ability to command soldiers and, you know, outthink and come up with a good plan, you know, to, to fight. He was honorably discharged on September 21st, 1945. Now, he returns home and people have heard about him, okay, like I said earlier. And all of a sudden, he gets a knock on the door. And it's like Hollywood producers, Hollywood directors, and so on. And they're telling him, how would you like to be in a movie? He's like, sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Now, most people, when they go to a movie set, they're like, oh, my God, look at that actor. Oh, my God, that's my other favorite actor. Things like that, you know. In his case, he shows up on the set, and actors are coming to him. You're Audie Murphy, aren't you? He's like, yeah. Oh my gosh, wow, it's an honor to meet you and things like that. People are just, wow, flabbergasted that this is the man. This is the legend and some of that. He makes a movie called To Hell and Back. It's basically a story about him, what he went through and stuff like that. Um, and the thing is, some of Hollywood people are like, oh yeah, we're going to have this guy come over here. They're going to do this. And he's like, uh, no, no, that's not how, that's not what you do at all, you know? So he was not only the star, he was also like the the correspondent person, the person who was could tell you that you know this is exactly what happened during the battles. This is exactly the protocol that soldiers would do, you know. Now, Audie Murphy passed away in the 1971, and he was buried in Arlington Cemetery. His grave is still the second most visited grave. At that whole cemetery. The number one person. Is President Kennedy. He's the most visited. But Audie Murphy is the second. Because again. Generations have heard of him. Less and less. But they have heard of him. And they're like. I gotta see if this, guy, this thing is legit. Or this guy. And they, yeah, you see all this information. Stuff about him. It's true. All right, so that's the end of this lesson. So hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, so you guys, you know, you take care. You be safe. Uh, I'll see you later. But also remember, don't forget, your projects are due now. Okay? Uh, you need to turn those in as soon as possible because the grading period ends. Uh, what's all right? Let's see. It's the 16th. Okay? So if you're listening to this and it's the 14th, you need to hurry up and get that project turned in. It's already late. And you need to make sure all your other work is done and completed and turned in. Okay. Because uh, remember, after this grading period, the next one is really short. And that's the end of the school year. We're done. Okay. So, like I said, that being said, uh, you guys have a good day. Take care. Be safe. And I'll see you guys later.